when Mark was six years old. We cast the devil out of him, and I think I may have to come back for another session. Calling it old and I want all you young people to go to Golden Corral tomorrow. Will you do that? We can go to Golden Corral. The reason we go to Golden Corral, that's the only place big enough to feed all of you. And we just don't want to cook for you because it's too crowded next door. So uh, we will have a deliverance service after service, and all of you women can cast the devil up out of Mark with me, and we'll <laughs> get him straightened out. You just pray for me. Uh, you know, it is true. I am going to become technologically s smart. And you just pray I'll be able to get into all of that and post something. You just pray for me. Because sometimes uh, computers are very, very difficult for me to understand. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit is not on a computer? You don't have to access him. You can just talk to him anytime. Well, we want to hear the Holy Spirit. Would you, would you just touch yourselves? I'm going to read three scriptures. And I want these scriptures to go into your heart, and then I'm going to pray for you. Philippians 1, 6. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with tr fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Father, we pray that these words that are written on paper will become eternal in our hearts, that we will connect with the good work, and that we're going to be able, as men and women of God, to press toward that which is the highest and the best for our lives. In the name of Jesus, I come against every demonic force that has been assigned to any person here tonight. The blood of Jesus is applied to us. The, the power of the Holy Spirit is present. And Satan, you have no place here. You have no power here. And we decree that you are helpless and useless and you have to stand still and let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. I speak freedom and liberty over every one of us and that we will all be touched tonight in an eternal way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I received the Reader's Digest. I read the Reader's Digest. And I received the last uh, copy. Uh, it was probably the month of March. I really didn't pay any attention to the, the month, but it was a Reader's Digest. And inside, there was a little section about advice that mothers had given to their children. And there was a, a, an article written by Nicholas Sparks. Nicholas Sparks is an author. He's written uh, the romance novels that a lot of younger people read and movies are being made of them. The Notebook was one of his writings. And so Nicholas Sparks' article was How to Grow Up. And it was about his mother and the advice that his mother had given him. Now, I, it's not my intent to read that article tonight, but I do want to quote some things that his mother told him as he was growing up. She said to him, life is not fair. She said, what you want in life and what you get in life are often two entirely different things. She said, your life is going to be what you make it. And you are responsible for the life that you lead. And this was her advice to her son. And he ended the article by saying he learned that at a very early age from his mother, that his life was what he was going to make it, that life really wasn't always fair, and that what we thought we would get out of life, we sometimes don't get that out of life. And, and we are, in the final analysis, responsible 
for our own lives. Now, the Apostle Paul completely agrees to some measure with Nicholas Sparks' mother. Because the Apostle Paul says to us, God has begun a good work in you, and he's well able to complete what he wants to do in your lives. But he does go on to say in the same epistle that even though God has begun a good work, we ourselves have to work out the good work of God. So he, he, he concluded by saying, uh, you have to work it out. God has begun a good work, but you have to work it out. You work it out. God's not going to work it out. You work out your own salvation. Now, he's not talking about, you know, saving yourselves from sin. But he's talking about the work of God, the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives after we are born again. And this is a really important point. It's something that out of all the mentoring conferences I've ever done, I, I feel like I'm about to break through to a level that's going to be very important for you to get, that there are the things of God that you have to work out. You have to work them out. You are responsible to a great measure for how God's work is going to go and what God I is going to do. The Apostle Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He did not say God is pushing me to it. It's something he had to do. Nobody else could do it for him. He said, I'm the one doing the pressing, and I'm, I'm going for the very uh, highest. Now, when we talk about to work out, that, that word in the Greek language really means to go for the best life possible. To go for the highest life possible. So that when you come to the end of your lives, you have dotted the T's, you have crossed the I's, and you're, you're not looking back wondering why it went so bad, but rather you can take a deep breath and say, praise God, I had the best life possible because of what God and I worked out. See, that's what God is saying. He wants you to have the best life possible. And when the Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, he was talking about the best life possible. And he himself said that it had to be worked out. Now, when he says, I'm pressing toward the mark, the mark was this best life possible. This is, this is the mark, the best life possible. He wanted to fulfill his prophetic destiny. He wanted to grab hold of that reason for which God had grabbed hold of him. And he wanted to come to the end of his life and put a period to it. And say, I did it. I did it. I lived the best life possible. But the Apostle Paul said, you have to work it out. You have to work it out. Now, I've been married 54 years this year to that man right there. And I'll tell you, we've had to do a lot of working out. <laughs> we didn't just coast here. We didn't just float down in some romantic river listening to romantic love songs. I'm telling you, there was a lot of working out. You've heard my testimony about the fourth day of our marriage. I couldn't cook. And every morning for the first three days, he would ask for scrambled eggs, and I couldn't cook. And he got burnt scrambled eggs. And on the fourth day after honey... On the first day, I need a scrambled egg, uh, egg over light is what it was. He wanted eggs over light. Second day, darling, I want eggs over light. And he'd always get burnt scrambled eggs because that's all I could do. Third day, June, I want eggs over light. Fourth day, what do I have to do to get eggs over light around here? I said, you have to cook them yourself. What do you think I am, your slave? 
If you wanted a woman to cook for you, you should have stayed with your mama instead of marrying me. I can't cook. Now, how many believe we had to work that out? He said to me that first year, our first year was hell on earth. And he said to me about midway through our first year, he said, I will never divorce you. Don't worry about it. I'll never leave you because I couldn't marry again and go through another first year. He said, I couldn't do that. <laughs> it was that bad, wasn't it? And it was mostly his fault, I'd like to say that. <laughs> Don't let him say anything, Shekinah. Okay, just keep him quiet. Keep him quiet. Just mostly his fault. And, you know, 54 years, we still have things we have to work out. Now, he told me real early when we were, you know, real young, he said, I don't like to decorate Christmas trees. And don't ask me to do it. But I just kind of forced him and shamed him and, you know, just made him decorate Christmas trees. So now we're in our older years, and the kids have gone, but I still decorate Christmas trees because I love Christmas. And I, my great room, you know, is two stories high. So I had this artificial nine-foot-tall Christmas tree, and I'm five feet four. So I, I'm having to climb a little ladder and take one ball up at a time and hang on the top of a nine-foot tree. Now, the problem was I had twisted my ankle, and I, I had broken a bone in my foot. I did not know a bone in my foot was broken. I thought I had just twisted my foot. But the foot ached, and every time I take a step up that little ladder to hang that ball at the top of the nine-foot tree, my foot would hurt. So I'm going up and down the ladder saying, Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Oh, God, help me. I speak healing. Help me, Jesus. Now, he's in the reclining chair working a crossword puzzle because we had kind of worked it out to that point. And, uh, you know, and I'm, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And finally, after about 20 balls at the top of the nine-foot tree, he had the nerve to put his pen down and look at me and say, do you need any help? <laughs> I'm telling you, I felt anger starting my toes. <laughs> that part of me, some of you know, is Sammy June. I felt Sammy June <laughs> rising up, and I thought I'm about to say something very ugly. So I went into the kitchen to pray in tongues, which is what I tell you to do when you're mad. So I just went into the kitchen, and I'm just, Unda ronge so I'm really mad, you know, but I'm praying in tongues. And here he comes into the kitchen holding this big little red ball. And he, he's got it like this. And he said, if you'll tell me what to do with this, I'll do it. So I told him what to do with it. And the Christian version of it is, put it in your reclining chair and sit on it. That's what I want you to do. Sit on it until it breaks. <laughs> you girls ought to be glad I got saved. I'd be really mean when I want to be. Now, he said to me after that, we're going to have to work this out. And I said, well, we are. You're going to have to start climbing the ladder. You know what he did? He hired a woman to climb the ladder, paid her money to climb the ladder. But I'm okay, it's his money. Came out of his pocket. We worked it out. We worked it out. Now let's come over to church. See, we come together, and we're going we're gonna to do something for God. We're, we're not individual, isolated people here. We are the body of Christ. So God takes us at salvation and puts us with a group of people. And those people become very important to our lives. Those people become the, the seedbed of our prophetic destinies. And I know you're like me. You join a church. 
and the pastor has a halo, and these are the sweetest little people God ever put you with. But everybody's nice until you get to know them. Have you ever <laughs> noticed that? <laughs> we love everybody until we get to know them. Now listen to me. I, I, I was at the tabernacle, and my tabernacle family's here. Uh, here they are. The, I grew up with the tabernacle in Alabama. I stayed there for 11 years until our pastor, Brother Arnold, sent us to South Georgia to start a church. Brother Arnold is still our pastor today. And those 11 years, I had to work things out. There, there was just a lot of working out. Because there were some Christians I went to church with that I wanted to tell them what to do with the big red ball. Have you ever gone to church and you think, I'd like to just tell them what to do with the red ball? Because, you know, people can irritate you. People... People, you know, can get next to you. And to stay in a church where God has placed you takes some working out. To run your course and to do what God has called you to do takes working out. Sometimes we, we talk about anointing, but dear women, I have been running my race since age 32 when God put me into ministry. And I learned that anointing has to be worked out. Ministry has to be worked out. Destiny has to be worked out. Marriage has to be worked out. Local church has to be worked out. And Nicholas Sparks' mother was right. Life isn't always fair. We know that to be true. Uh, sometimes what you get is not what you expected. Women just line up in front of me all the time, want me to pray, bubble, ask them to marry them. And then the next year I go back and they're wanting to know if I can pray Bubba out of their lives because Bubba was not what they expected. Sometimes what you want and the way it came and what you expected it is, are two entirely different things because life just has a way of being that way. Lelia Johnson goes with me to Mexico. Lelia is one of my good friends who travels me. There she is right there. Stand up, Lelia, and let everybody know. You know who Lelia is. <laughs> Lelia is one of the pickiest eaters I've ever traveled with. She's just real funny about what she eats, and she hates cheese, which is a major problem in Mexico. <laughs> so we go to Mexican restaurants and Lelia asks all of the Hispanics, what is this and what does it look like and what is in it? And then they, you know, persuade her to order it and they bring it to the table and I can tell by the look on Lelia's face that what she wanted and what she got were two entirely <laughs> different things that that dish did not come out of the kitchen the way she thought it was going to come out. Now, life's that way. That, that's just the way life is. Now, when, when life isn't fair and when what we wanted and what we got were two different things, we Christians are very good at blaming God. Now, let's be honest. I'm going to be real honest here. In the body of Christ, we live different kinds of lives. In this room tonight, there are people who live really good, successful Christian lives. And then there are people who are, are just never seem to get off the bottom rung of God's ladder. And we look at that, and what we do is we tend to blame God. And we say, God, you're not fair. You're not, you're not fair. Uh, what we want and what we got are two different things, and you're just not being fair. But we need to understand something, that God is no respecter of persons. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. God is merciful to all people. He's not partial. He's not prejudiced. Uh, God, God is just this fair God. And Ezekiel 18.25 says this about God's people talking to him, God said, you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. 
meaning that God doesn't treat everybody alike. And here's God's answer to that. Here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, it, are not your ways unequal. Now what God's saying there, now hear me, this is real important. God hadn't got any problems tonight. The problems are down here. You follow this? We, we can never point a finger at God and say, God, the reason it's not working is you. That is not true. God said, I'm doing a good work, but you're going to have to work it out. You have to work out healing. You have to work out deliverance. You have to work out love. You have to work out joy. See, these are things that God wants in our lives as Christians. But these are things that we have to work out. We, we, we just cannot uh, blame God because God is at work. Now, through the years, I've learned this. And I've learned you just have to work some things out. You have to take what it is, and then you just begin to work. Uh, I've always wished I have beautiful, glorious, thick hair. But I've never had that kind of hair. It's baby fine, it's thin, it's wimpy, it's weak. And through the years, thank God, I've worked it out to this point. Hallelujah. 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 If you see some of my early pictures, you'd say, thank God she kept working at it. <laughs> I actually had a woman say to me one time, uh, it's amazing to me God could anoint anybody the way he's anointed you with such a head of hair. She actually said that to me. So I have improved, but I've had to work at it. And to be where I am at age 73, I want you to know I've been working at this a long time. I didn't come to my old age unexpectedly. When I was 30 years old, I looked ahead, and I said, this is where I want to be when I'm in my 70s. And I've been working really hard to get there. I've been working at it. Been, been working at it. So God tells us tonight that he wants us to live the greatest, highest lives possible. He wants us to go for prophetic destiny. He wants us to come to the end of our lives and to say like the uh, Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I, I have finished my course. See, those are testimonies of a man who understood that he had to work it out. He had to fight. He had to keep. And he had to finish. He wrote this to us. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, he said, Do you not know that those who run in a race run all, but only one is going to receive the prize? Now listen to this. Run in such a way that you obtain the prize. That means the greatest life possible. That's what the prize is. That reward of having done life the way God wanted you to do it. Therefore, I run. Not with uncertainty, I fight, not as somebody who beats the air, but I discipline my body, I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, I read that one day, and, you know, I'm, I am one who preaches to others, and I thought, dear God, I can preach to others and, and not live the best life possible. If I don't start working some things out, even though I'm preaching to others, I'm going to live down here at a very low level because I, I didn't make effort. And Paul made a lot of effort. He said, I, I run with purpose. I discipline myself. I don't fight like somebody beating the air because I know if I don't work things out that I myself can be disqualified. I can lose that prize. Now, I was asked to introduce a speaker at a conference. It was a rather large conference, and I didn't know her, but they just said to me, would you introduce her? She was going to speak at a certain segment of the program. So she and I are sitting on the platform together, and she leans over to me, and she says, now, June, she said, when you introduce me, she said, I'm going to have the cordless mic at this chair. She was sitting to the back of the platform. 
and she said, now when you introduce me, she said, you immediately step aside because I'm going to start preaching from that chair. And by the time I reach the podium, I'm going to have all of these women, there were about 2,000 women, I'm going to have them on their feet shouting. Now, I had preached to them. And I thought, well, honey, if you can do it, more power to you. Because I gave it all I could. I tap danced, I shouted, I spit and prophesied. And they just filed their nails while I did it. And I thought, if you can get them on their feet between that chair and this podium, have at it. And I said, good for you. You just get them on their feet and just have them shouting. Well, she was rather odd to look at, and I won't describe her, but she was one of these women you kind of, she was just odd to look at. And you can just ask God to figure it out for you, but she was odd to look at. So sure enough, I said, and here she is, and I said her name, and she let out a yell from back there. Well, it scared everybody. <laughs> and you know, they're just, and then when she stood up, she's odd to look at, and they're just kind of, and she's up here, and they never closed their mouths because she was kind of odd. And nobody ever stood up. Nobody ever shouted. Nobody ever raised her hand. She was devastated, wept, cried, talked to me about it. And I said, honey, you're just not going to go very far till you work this out. I said, you have to learn to stand up and preach to people who stare at you with cold eyes and who play cards while you're prophesying to them. And I said, if you can't do that, you're not going to go very far in the ministry. That's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. See, we just equate sometimes the work of God and the power of God and the anointing of God with these great, great feelings. Now, God tells us very clearly I have begun a good work, and I'm going to finish it. So the problem's not with the beginning. The problem's not with the end. But I'm telling you, the middle can kill you. <laughs> because you've got to travel the middle. And they're, listen, I'm serious. There are people who've never made it to the end. The middle took their lives. They died young. They died early. Left the ministry. Left church left God. Now tonight, I, my head looks pretty good. That's about the best I could do with it. My feet look good. Amen. But the middle, <laughs> let's everybody just look at the middle a minute. Dear God, that's why we covered it up. <laughs> Those little malted milk balls are growing in your belly as we speak. And then we're going to go over there and do some more sugar, and there's just going to be a middle. Thank God we covered up the middle. Aren't you glad we covered up the middle? Because I don't have much trouble here and here, but it's the middle. It's that middle. And the middle with God is a problem. God said, I'm going to do something here, and you're going to be women of prophetic destiny. I've laid hold of you, and now you're going to lay hold of life, but you're going to have to work it out. You're going to have to work it out. Now, the Apostle Paul began on the Damascus Road, and my goodness, what a testimony. Who wouldn't want that testimony? He was a Pharisee, a religious Jew, who believed he was called of Jehovah Yahweh to kill Christians and to do away with the Christian church. And a light of glory blinded him, and Jesus spoke to him audibly and told him what to do. And he began to preach. Now, what chills and thrills must have been in that man's body that day? The light of glory, the voice of, of Jesus. And, and he, he just had this marvelous beginning. But I, I want you to, I'm going to read it to you. It's his own personal testimony about the middle. And here's what he said. He said, I've worked harder than any of you. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged and beaten more severely than any of you. I've been exposed to death again and again. 
Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. That means he received a total of 195 stripes on his body. Three times I was beaten with rods. So he was beaten three times in addition to the 195. He said, I was shipwrecked, and I spent a day and a night in the open sea floating. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in dangers from bandits, in dangers from my own countrymen, in danger from the Gentiles, in dangers in the city, in dangers in the country, in dangers from false brethren. I have labored, I've toiled, I've often gone without sleep. I've known hunger, I've known thirst, and I've gone without food, and I've been cold and naked, and beside all of this, I have to take care of all these churches I started. Now, that's his middle. That, that, was, that was his middle. And dear people, when we read, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, we, we think of it as a pretty little Bible verse, and we embroidered it and hang it on, you know, little frames in our bathroom. We put it in pretty little cards. But it was a very real thing to this man. I mean, he had to press to work out the best life possible. This was a man that was totally dedicated to working out the good work of God. Now, I, I read that testimony how many believe anybody in the room might have stopped with the first beating? How many believe we might have pointed a finger and gone and said, well, enough of this. Enough of this. The first sermon Jesus ever preached in Nazareth, they tried to kill him. They tried to throw him over a cliff. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't quit? You know, it'd be like somebody saying to me, "Not how'd the mentor conference go? And I said, well, they tried to kill me in the parking lot. <laughs> how many believe I might not be here in the morning if you're trying to kill me in the parking lot? I might not show up. And I read the Apostle Paul's testimony. And I think, what did the man think when they put his back the first time and beat him? And then he went back the second time, and they beat him. And then five times, and they beat him. What did he think when, when he was floating in, the o in an open sea for 36 hours in a hurricane, waiting for somebody to come rescue him, holding on to a board, praying for his life? How did he feel when they beat him with rods three times. How, what did he think when the Corinthians turned against him and said, you're not our apostle? And he wrote the whole second Corinthians because they had kind of turned their thumbs down on him. So when the apostle Paul said, uh, look, I'm here at the end and I fought. He, he really had fought. When he said, I kept the faith. He wasn't just talking about defending Jesus. I think he meant that when his back was being beaten, he held tight to the power and the call of God on his life and said, it hurts, but I'm going to work this out. I'm going to work this out. God and I are going to work this out. See, the, the, the words we read are just pretty Bible words until we understand that there's a lot of working out that goes when we press for the mark. If you want to run for the prize, there just has to be a, a lot of working out. And the Apostle Paul never let his emotions rob him of what God was doing. He never copped an attitude toward God or people. He always just kept fixed on this, this best life possible. And he pressed through it all to come to the highest life possible. Now, Jesus tells us something about Christianity. And I'm not sure our generation understands this about the Christian faith. In Matthew 11, verse 12, Jesus said, From the days of John the Baptist until now. So we're just going to take the until now and make it 2013. From the days of John the Baptist until 
February 2013, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing. I'm taking those words, suffering violence, and changing it to what it really means. And forceful people have laid hold on it and have advanced it. Forceful people. Now, we Christians are here today because from the days of John the Baptist, there were some people who understood that to do the best life possible, to fulfill the purposes, the destinies, the callings of God, took some force. It took some people with some backbone. It took some people with some uh, stick to it. It took some people that, that understood that, that I'm going to work this out with God and no devil, no person, no whip, no bad temper is going to rob me from what God has called me to do. Forceful people advancing the kingdom. And Jesus said, you have to understand this about the kingdom. That the kingdom of God has come to us today. We're preaching it today. Because there were some people who just wouldn't bow their back. There were some people who understood destiny. And there were some people who locked into something that was eternal and put their hands and arms together with God and pushed it forward in spite of what hell could do. In spite of what hell could do. Pushed it forward. Just those kinds of people. I, I get real stirred about those kinds of people. So the, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 1. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now those witnesses are these forceful people who, who did a work for God before we showed up. These are the ones who've already gone to heaven and entered into their rewards. And he said, we're surrounded by these people who, who did it right, who went for the highest life possible, who did it God's way. He said, now it's our turn, and let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, because now it is our time to lay hold and push it forward. We're going to push it forward to a generation behind us, so that if Jesus doesn't come a hundred years from now, somebody will be sitting on this corner listening to somebody preach, because there was a woman and man that pushed it forward. Hallelujah. Pushing it forward. And we read about them in the Bible. Dear Lord, we read about them. And, and let us be very sure. Abraham had to work some things out. He's the father of the Jewish nation. But Abraham had to work things out. Moses had a lot that he had to work out. And we read Hebrews 11. And these are just men and women that worked it out. Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than his brother Cain did. And I read that, and I say, God, I want to be known for my offerings. I don't want to just drop a quarter in an offering plate. I want to be known for my offerings. I want to go to heaven and hear God say, Girl, you gave some good offerings. Hallelujah. I like those offerings that you gave. I read about Enoch walking with God. And I, I've already decided, I, I just like that. If Jesus doesn't come and I pass on, be on my tombstone. going to put it in my will because I'm not going to let my boys write on my tombstone. I'm going to write what I want on my tombstone. You never know what boys will put on your tombstone, so you need to be careful. I'd like people to say she walked with God. I can't think of any greater thing than to press to a relationship that people look at me and say she walked with God. Noah built an ark. Wouldn't you like to build something that 100 years now people talk about it? Just built that ark in the middle of the desert. Now, this is one I don't want, a baby in my old age like Sarah. I don't want that, but I'm telling you, that old girl got one when she was 90 years old, and I do not want that. 
You stay on your edge of the bed, and I'll stay on my edge of the bed. <laughs> we'll kiss this way. You have to get the tape from this morning to understand that. Now listen to what, listen to what Hebrews says. These are the people who, who've gone before us. Hebrews says they're, they're people that, that endure to seeing something invisible. Listen to that. People who look beyond this life and caught a vision of something that nobody else saw. And we read their stories today. And Hebrews says these people subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were valiant in flight in fight they turned to flight the armies of the aliens women received their dead raised back to life and there were no passive maintainers here now listen to me because where we what we do with God is we start over here with the good work of God and what we really want is right here in the middle we want something that's very comfortable. We want something that's very easy so that we can be what I call passive maintainers, meaning that we were reached back here, and now we're just going to maintain a nice, sweet little relationship with God, but we're not going to advance the kingdom forward. And God needs a generation who are not passive maintainers, but who will stand up in this hour and say, somebody before me preached that I can be preached to today, and now it's my turn, and I'm going to pick up my, my sword and my flame for God and run my race. I'm going to run my race. Because it's, it's our time, women. It's our time. It's our generation. And Paul said you have to press to do that. And I, th I think what this culture sometimes is seeking, where God and church is concerned, is something comfortable. And dear me, how many of you have ever dealt with the Holy Spirit? I get real uncomfortable <laughs> with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will tell you to walk on water. The Holy Spirit will tell you to buy a building when you don't have any money. He'll tell you to build an ark out in the middle of a desert. And, and we just want the Holy Spirit to make us comfortable. And we sing about him, sweet Holy Spirit. He is sweet. But dear Lord, he doesn't want us to passively maintain a religious program where we come and we just sing songs and we give our offerings and we pray for each other. God wants people who lock into kingdom advancement and destiny, not comfort, not religious comfort. And so this is what Paul means when he says you have to work it out. You can go as far as you want to go with God. And you can rise as high as you want to go with God. Now God reached me when I was 15 years old as a Christian, but when I was 30 years old, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I, I really began to move toward my destiny. I would hear preaching like this, and, and I, I got a vision that I had a call of God on my life, that I had a, an eternal purpose to fulfill. And so when I was 32 years old, God spoke to me to start a Bible study in my home, and I began my run. I, I began to serve God. Now, I was a, a stay-at-home mother when God began to work with me and put me in full-time ministry. I, I literally didn't even have clothes to speak in because I was a stay-at-home mother. I didn't have what I call speaking clothes. And, and I used to really pray about what to wear because I was just a stay-at-home mom and people would invite me to speak. 
but, but I began to serve God. And I began to press into the place that I'm in today. So by the grace of God and with the help of God and a lot of good teaching, a good pastor, a good local church I was in, I, I was able to navigate this middle. So now I've come to my latter years. I'll be 74 next month. And in my thinking, I thought, well, God, I've been doing this a long time. Now what I want for Jean and me is this comfort nest. I, I want us to end with this, you know, easy lifestyle. We can just kind of preach and maintain and passive. And, and one day I was reading the Bible, and God said, The former things are over with, and behold, I'm going to do a new thing. <laughs> and I thought, well, he must be talking to my grandchildren, because I, I don't want any more new things. I've been there, done that. I did that when I was 32 years old and came through the middle. I thought I was through the middle, people. I really did. I wasn't planning to retire. I was just going to passively maintain and have this pleasant, sweet old age and just passively maintain. And God spoke to me and said, the former things have ended and I'm going to do a new thing. And someone in the church prophesied, came up to me and prophesied that to me. Said, God's about to do something new. And you need to get ready. God's going to do something new. Now, I prayed about it. I said, God, you know how old I am. And you know I don't want to retire because I love what I do. But I just don't want to be stretched. I, do, I just don't really want to be stretched anymore. Don't want to have to walk on the waters anymore. And then God sent Mark and Robin up here. And all of a sudden, the church changes, and the music changes, and the lights change. And, you know, I, I'm of this generation back here where we sung Jehovah Jireh. My provider, the Lord is... And I love those old songs. I've been to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he chose from me. Those were my songs. And all of a sudden, they're singing songs I don't know. And I said, God, I'm just too old to learn these songs with these kids. Just too old to learn these songs. And God spoke to me. Now listen to me, this is real important. God told me that I was going to take the Holy Spirit and make him a 1980s Holy Spirit so that he would just anoint songs from the 1980s. And, and that he really didn't like the new thing. He was just a 1980s Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit told me he was through with the 1980s a long time ago. And if I wanted to move with him, I had to just hip-hop right over here to 2013 and learn to sing some new songs. Learn to dance a different way. Hang some new stuff on the walls. Buy myself some new clothes and get out of the old clothes. I just had to do that. Now, Gene's testimony is he hadn't sung a song in church in over 10 years that he likes because he likes those old songs. My rock of Ages. He loves Rock of Ages. They don't sing Rock of Ages anymore. But you know what Gene's done? He's pressed. Now, I sit by him every Sunday here in church. Now, now listen to me. I'm here and sing. He cannot carry a tune in a bucket. He doesn't know any of the songs on the screen, but he's over here just singing at the top of his voice. He doesn't hit a note. But hear me, it's not about hitting the notes. It's about praising God and going with what God's doing. We've got to go with the flow, girls. And so God surrounded me with all these kids, these young people. And all of a sudden, here I am running faster than I ever ran. I'm going to tweet and Twitter. Can you believe this? I can't believe I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. By the grace of God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to reach a generation because I'm a woman of destiny. 
And if I have to push my way into it, I'm going to push my way into it. If I have to press through all my prejudices, I'm going to press through my prejudices. I'm going to stay in step with the Holy Ghost. And I'm not going to tie him to a religion that's comfortable for me. I'm not a passive maintainer. I'm a woman of faith. I keep the faith. I fight the fight. I'm a woman of faith, not a passive maintainer. And we have to get with it. Now, now I know what my calling is. I'm a teacher, and I am going to begin to do teaching. I know this. This is a vision we've had, and we've never done it. And I know that's ahead of us. And I know I'm going to, already we're impacting, you heard Mark say, 60,000 people in one download. That blew me away. I thought we hadn't even left Douglasville. And we're preaching to 60,000 people. I have men all the time from Pakistan wanting to be my friends on Facebook. I don't friend them because I don't know if they want to marry me or just... <laughs> And I like the one I have, so. <laughs> but that's because of Internet. That's because of live streaming. And, and the other night, we had a, a worship Sunday night here where we just came and worshiped God. We didn't preach. We just sang and worshiped God. And my little six-year-old granddaughter stood at this altar with her hands raised, singing the songs of this generation. Now, that's powerful for me, women. That's powerful for me. I'm willing to go there to reach that little 60-year-old granddaughter so that when Mama June goes to heaven, I got me some Evans that are lined up at altars singing the praises of God. See, this is, this is what it's about. We are not passive maintainers. I, I read the stories in the Old Testament about those saints of God. I want my stories. I want my stories. I want to be able to say, I was hanging by my fingernails and God showed up and acted like God. God told us to buy a building and praise God we bought it. We want stories. We do not want our lives to be about problems. We want our lives to be about prophetic destiny. And God will handle the problems. He who has begun a good work will complete it if we can just, you know, handle the middle. Now, sometimes I'm ashamed of us because I've been in church a long time. I've been in, I've been in several different moves of God. And left ourselves, we hunt comfort. And when it becomes uncomfortable, we move somewhere else because we want comfort. And I, I see a lot of just... Weak, weak people who, who just don't have backbone. And they get their feelings hurt and they disappear. Somebody didn't speak to them on Sunday morning, they're gone. Dear God, what's wrong with us? What is wrong with us? Uh, I, I, I've seen uh, speakers, because I've, I've been a part of conferences, and I've just seen speakers, and I think, dear Lord, they're disqualifying themselves. Uh, there was one speaker just threw a fit because she was in a bed and breakfast. And she wanted to be in a hotel with room service. And she was going to have to get up and go downstairs and eat breakfast. And she just was real mad about it. And I thought, dear Lord, you ought to send her to some backwoods area of the world and make her live in a tent a while, and then she'll appreciate a bed and breakfast, but I'm not God, so thank God I'm not God, because that's what I'd have done with her. I'd have shipped her off, <laughs> made her live in a tent for six months and get an, over that attitude. I knew a woman, a speaker, that uh, insisted on green M&Ms in her hotel room with, with certain kinds of candles. And I thought, what are we, some kind of prima donnas? that we have to have green M&Ms. Dear God, I've, I've eaten food I really did have to pray over because I didn't know what it was. I just <laughs> prayed over it and ate it. Years ago, we had a woman in the church here, and she came to Jean and said, I just don't know why 
nobody likes me. She was in charge of something. She said, nobody will work with me. And she said, the Lord told me if I'd come talk to you, that you would tell me what's wrong. And Jean told her, he said, well, you're critical and hard to work with. She screamed, ran out in the parking lot, crying, and never came back to church. And I said to Jean, why in the world did you tell her she was critical? He said, well, she asked me what was wrong with her. I said, well, I know that's what was wrong with her, but you should have known she's going to cut and run. I've never seen her again. Listen to me, women. We've got to get over this stuff. We've got to get over this stuff. Seeking some kind of comfortable religion where we just join hands with people we like and they say, sing songs that make us feel warm and fuzzy. God is not a God of warm, fuzzy feelings. He's a God of kingdom advancement, prophetic destiny. Women who will push their way through all of the turmoil. We've got to loose the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit. Theodore Roosevelt said this in a speech. He said, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out the strong man who stumbled or where the doer of deeds should have done it better. He said the credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, the person who plays the game, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who actually does try to do the deed, who actually does try to do the deed, who knows great enthusiasm and great devotion and spends his life in a worthy cause who, at least if he fails, he has dared to do something great. See, that's the kind of people we like. That's the kind of person I want to be. We ought to have some resurrections of the dead. We ought to just have some people that stand up and say, we can raise the dead. If God wants them raised, we can raise the dead. Some healers of diseases. That we can heal diseases. We can push our way through the darkness of this hour and push our way into kingdom advancement and kingdom destiny. Jesus said the kingdom of God from John the Baptist until now has been forcefully advanced. People who, who worked it out. People who worked it out. Now I saw, I guess it was a vision. I've actually had this, this vision twice and it concerned the mentoring conference. And I saw great darkness. And I remembered Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter, uh, I think it's 60. And he said, Behold, gross darkness will cover the earth and the peoples of the earth. And I was praying about the conference, and I saw this dark, dark cloud. It was supernaturally black. It, it was worse than any tornadic cloud we could see. And it covered the whole horizon. Uh, all, all I could see uh, was just this dark, dark cloud. And it was rolling toward me and a group of people. And I knew the group of people was the body of Christ. And I saw that Satan's tactic is to bring in gross darkness and gross evil and to come against God's people with that darkness and capture us in it so, so that we're, we're not people who advance the kingdom. We're not people who are doing what we're put here to do. We're just trying to fight in the darkness and trying to get darkness off of our lives. And I saw that. That cloud was rolling toward us. And all of a sudden, I, I saw just people. And, and in what I saw on the front line was a group of women. And they weren't much bigger than me, just little women. And all of a sudden, they began to pop up. And I saw them put their hands out like this. And they began to press against that darkness. And then others popped up with them. And they began to press against that darkness. And others began to pop up. And all of a sudden, there was a big, huge group of people pressing behind that front row of pressers. 
And I saw us begin to press and press and press, and darkness was driven back and kingdom advanced when God's women and God's men pressed toward the high calling. So women, these are difficult days, but li listen to me. This is our time. We're, if we're going to do great exploits, now's the time. I don't want to sit home and watch American Idol when God's moving. I don't want to be one of those critics on the sideline criticizing young people who are serving God. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. I want to be right in the middle of the race course. And my invitation to you tonight is I'm running my race, and I want you to get on the track with me and let us run together. Hallelujah. 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 I want my New England sisters to come up here. Would you come up here? Annette and Kim and Kathy Craig. This is the first time they've been here. I work with these girls through Women of the Word. And Women of the Word is going to have conferences uh, next month in Bangor, Maine. And Vermont, I'll be in Vermont for one day. And then there's a Vermont next year. Uh huh. And then you're working in Connecticut in September. Now, I've been up there with them a couple of times, and I'm telling you the Holy Spirit is doing something in New England. The Holy Spirit, you know, they call themselves the frozen chosen, <laughs> but I'm telling you, God is moving up there. Yeah. And I want them to turn and face me, and I want some of you, just some of you ministers and leaders, we're going to pray for New England. Will you do that with me? That these girls are going to release a revival. In New England. I want you to straight, Cindy, just come on up. You just come on up. Some of you who are ministers feel like you want to come up, want to lay hands on them. It's hard up there. They've shared with me. Uh, it's real hard up there. Uh, Kim was sharing with me. I was there with her in January. That it's just been hard for her and her husband. It's just, a, it's just a, an area of our country that hasn't been the way the South has been touched. So, Father, we pray for Kathy and Annette and Kim. We're their sisters in Christ, and we thank you now, Lord, that these girls are going to advance the kingdom in New England and even beyond, that you are going to feel the, the backbone of the Holy Spirit rise up in all three of you, the backbone of the Holy Spirit is going to rise up in all three of you. That your minds are going to receive creative ideas from the Father. Your minds are going to receive the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Your minds are going to have revelation from on high. And Lord, I thank you for the work of God that's going to be in the churches represented by our three sisters. I thank you, Lord, for the work of God that is going to happen in the Women of the Word conferences. And we pray for New England that the fire of the Holy Ghost will fall out that which is frozen, that there will be a supernatural intervention of God in the name of the Lord. And Kim, I, I see things that came heavy against you and your husband in the call that you have. It, it was like all of a sudden, Satan just rolled in a, a rock, a wall, and you just kind of hit that wall. And I saw that Satan was trying to stop something that God wanted to do there. But I see by the Spirit that that wall is falling down flat, and that in the year 2013, you're going to see some things change. You're going to see things change in your city, change in your ministry, change in your vision, change in the way you do life with God. There is great, great change coming to you. And I see things, Kim, that you've laid on the altar and you've prayed over them, personal stuff, just personal stuff. I don't know what it is, but you've laid it on an altar. And God said to tell you, he's got every bit of it in his hand. Just every bit of it in his hand. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. I see women coming to you, Annette, like Velcro, sticking to you. 
I see Velcro all over you. Women going to stick to you. Women going to stick with you. Uh, it hadn't happened yet, but there's Velcro, like sticking to you, like Velcro, to do the work of God. I thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in Vermont with Kathy, what you're going to do in her church. I thank you, Lord, uh, far beyond just women of the word, Kathy. Uh, you're going to be a seed scattered all over New England. God is going to put you one place. You're going to plant a seed and pick you up and put you another place. Plant a seed, put you another place and plant a seed. You're going to be a sower of seed. And then you're going to leave New England. You're going to go other places and sow seed. Going to sow seed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We pray for them, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 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 Now I want to pray for pastors and leaders, whoever you are. If you have a ministry and you're a leader or a pastor, I want to pray for you. Just come on up. Pastors, leaders of ministries. These are our girls that are in the forefront. These are, let's thank God for them. Pastors, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's make a straight line. Why don't the rest of you stand up and stretch your hands out toward them? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. The Lord said to tell you that some catch you by surprise, that I didn't see that one coming, or I didn't expect that, or when I started way back here, uh, what I got is not what I expected. And God said to tell you that nothing ever has caught him by surprise, that things you and Tommy are struggling with today, God's not struggling with it a bit because none of it's caught God by surprise. And God knows how to work it out. God knows how to smooth it out. God knows what he wants to do. And God said, just link your arm with him and begin to work with him and watch what God's going to do. Watch what God's going to do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, we pray for our pastors. We pray for our leaders. In the name of Jesus Christ, women, I speak prophetic destiny over every one of you that the power of Almighty God will rest upon you in this generation, that you won't be caught in some Holy Ghost of the past, but you'll stay fresh and you'll stay new with God, that you'll follow what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. You won't lock him into a comfortable religion, but you will press, 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 Donna, press, Press. Don't get tired of pressing, Donna. Don't get tired of pressing. Don't you and your husband get tired of pressing. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. There's something there. Keep pressing, Chris. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Be exactly what God told you in key, Cindy. Exactly what he told you. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. In Jesus' name, be anointing upon Mark and Robin to take Believer's Church where they need to go. Lord, open doors for Giovanna. Lord, this conversation we had before, work it out. Work it out. Show her how to work it out. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. In the name of the Lord, I lay my hands that the power and the anointing will be upon our leaders here. And they'll just be supernatural. Supernatural manifestation we had a prophetic word miracles signs wonders miracles Debbie Deborah signs wonders hallelujah hallelujah miracles signs and wonders Terry you gonna work it out I don't know how I don't know how it's gonna go but it's gonna be worked out I have great peace about that just just be at rest everything's gonna work out it'll work out It'll work out. God knows your heart. Elizabeth, I lay my hands on you. Amen. 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 There's an opposition from hell that's going to stop in Jesus' name. An opposition from hell. You're being moved to a new place. 
a new anointing. In Jesus' name, I just release the call and the destiny of God that you're a mighty women of God. You will never be a passive maintainer, Janine. You'll never be that. You're not that. Don't go for passive maintaining. God's going to open some doors and work some things out. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I just release the anointing, the power of God. If you've been prayed for, step back, and the next one, step up. Lord, I pray for Lelia. I thank you, Lord. Oh, the greatest is ahead of you, Lelia. The greatest is ahead of you. The greatest is ahead of you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Did I pray for everybody up here? Everybody here, right here. All right. In Jesus' name, I lay my hands upon you that you'll press into the high calling. You won't be satisfied with second best, Kimberly. Don't be satisfied. There's something really tall and big ahead of you. Go for the highest. I, I just speak a release, Lane, a release like you've never had before in your ministry and in your calling. A release from the uh, lack of things. A release from lack of things, lack of people, lack of money. No lack, no lack. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Father for the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I release you. I release you, Wita, to the power and the anointing of God. Run your highest race. Run your highest race. Run your highest race. I see you on a racetrack, and you're just running your best. God said, run your best. Run your best. Don't listen to the critics. Run your best. Run your best. In Jesus' name. I find if you're running fast enough, you can't hear your critics anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we had a, we had a prophecy here that God was going to do miracles during this conference. Now, I do know this about miracles. Miracles sometimes have to be pressed into. There are instant miracles, but I've received miracles that I had to press my way into it. And if you need a miracle tonight, I want you to come forward as a statement that you and God are going to work this thing out and you're going to press your way to victory. If that's you, I want you to come down real quickly and we're going to pray for you. You need a miracle. You came here needing a miracle. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amari, uh, miracles aren't hard for God. It's just hard for you. God said to tell you, this thing that looks so hard to you is not hard at all to God. It just looks hard to you. And God just wants you to know it's just real easy for him to do what he needs to do. And he just wants you to start saying, uh, I'm getting a miracle. This is real easy. This is real easy. I believe. And all things are possible because I believe. I release a miracle into your life. I release a miracle in the name of Jesus. Come here and pray for her. Let's keep praying for her. Just put your hand on her and keep praying. I release a miracle in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I release a miracle. I release miracles. You're going to press. You're going to press. Now, now, Jessica, I, I've been drawn to you. you. Jessica goes to our church. And honey, God began to deal with me when I was real young like you. And God's got some wonderful, wonderful things ahead of you. And he, I don't know what's going on in your life, but God wants you to shake it off. God wants you to shake it off. And God wants you to go for the highest. God doesn't want this middle to get you all stumbled up and tied up and mixed up. God said, shake it off. Just shake it off and run your best race. Unload that stuff. There's stuff you need to just unload it and leave it at the altar tonight and shake it off in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, receive your miracle. Receive your miracles. In Jesus' name, God is a God of miracles. And you and God are going to press into a miracle 
like you never have before. Hallelujah. Barbara, just keep pressing. I know you've been pressing a long time. I've been pressing with you. Keep pressing. It's coming. It's coming. We never quit pressing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We, we, speak, we speak total health and healing to, to Jan. Hallelujah. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And he makes your mortal body alive. In Jesus' name, receive your miracles. Receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Now, Vivian, you know better than I do. Way back when, God put his hand on you. And there's been a lot of stuff in the middle. Just a lot of stuff in the middle. And God said tonight that the reign of the Holy Spirit is washing all the mud of the middle off of you. And all that stuff that's in the past is over. It's done with. It's finished. And God said, you're going to leave here a new woman tonight. And he wants you to start running again. He wants you to put on your running shoes and start running again. I don't know what happened, but I do know way back there when I first met you, there's a mighty call of God on you. And don't let the middle defeat you, honey. Keep running. Keep running. Because God, God wants us to have miracles. God said in this conference there would be miracles. We'll press our way into the miracle power of God. And I want you women, when you go home, to remember what I said, miracles are pressed into I want you to say on February 17th, I believe for my miracle, and I'm pressing my way to a miracle, not going backwards anymore, pressing my way forward. I'm a woman of advancement. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and I'm one of those forceful women that will take my miracle. I will take it. I will take my miracle. I will take my miracle by force will not be denied, will not be denied, will not be denied, will not be denied. I want you to be that kind of women. I will not be denied. God and I are going to see a miracle, a mighty miracle of God. I release miracle power, Tara, miracle power. In the name of the Lord, the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Beth, I really felt you were here to get a miracle this time. And I speak a miracle to you. A miracle to you. In Jesus' name, miracle power. Miracle power. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Lord Ranga Beko Soto. Kinda Rosso Kabekera. Kelio so Ranga Beko so Rosso Tita Bakaharada. Shelo Rosso Toto Tianda. Mande Rosso Toto Tiando. Rosso. Now the Lord would say to you to remember that, that a, there's the miracle of a seed, that a seed goes into the ground, and one day the ground is pushed up by just a little bud, a little leaf. But that little seed grows and grows and grows until it becomes full flowered, full fruit. And God said, you're going to see a miracle like a seed. Don't despise those little blades. Don't despise those little things. But know God's sending you a miracle. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Well, honey, you're going to have your stories. You're going to have stories. You're going to sit around and tell other girls your stories. You're going to tell them what God did for you. You're not going to listen to women like me tell their stories. You're going to have your own stories of miracles, your own stories of salvation that God brought to you and what God did. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I just speak a miracle into you, my brother. Lord, you're here by divine appointment tonight that we can, we can lay our hands upon you. 
I want you to be forceful. I want you to be forceful. I want you not to be denied. Have some backbone. Say, I'm getting my miracle. I'm receiving my miracle. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. Have we prayed for everybody? In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name. I see something opening up for you, and it's a prophetic destiny. It's not just about a miracle here tonight, but you really do have a prophetic calling on your life. You're a woman that's come to this time, and God is just going to release something in you. Go for the best life possible. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I just pray for you. I pray for you. I prayed for you, right? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I pray for Tig in Jesus' name. For the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you now for what you're doing. Bringing a miracle as I lay my hands on them. We're releasing miracle power into their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now let's all say this together. Would you lay hands upon yourselves? Say, Father, tonight I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to go for the highest life possible. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to work out my life with the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to fulfill my destiny with the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to have my testimonies. I'm going to have my stories. And I'm going to go for the highest. I will not let the middle defeat me. I'm going to go for the best. I will not be disqualified because I'm going to run with anointing and grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Now stand to your feet. Listen to me. Is going to that little small fellowship hall and sitting very skinny and visiting with people. I went over there before the service. It's all kind of good food. And I'm about to pray and cast the calories out. So you can just go over there and enjoy.